Okay, uh, so um, we, we are very glad to have Shiraz uh, Skyping in from, uh, I'm not sure where, but uh, Canada, I think, uh, to give yeah. us the, the first talk of the morning. I think it's very late, Shiraz, so thank you very much for staying up late uh, to give us this talk. Um, so uh, just a couple of logistical comments. Uh, he can't see the audience, so if you have a question, you have to take the mic and, and uh, actually speak, so that uh, uh, otherwise he doesn't know if you're asking a question. Uh, the second logistical convention is we have a timer here, but I think you can't see it. Huh? <laughs> we have a timer here, which I think you uh, cannot see. Uh, but I, 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 just you can um, you can shout. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, no, no, I'm 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 saying so that, that so so the the talk is 55 minutes plus plus five minutes for questions. So we have a timer. At some point, it'll it'll buzz. So you can start. 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 Okay. Uh, Give it my perfect timing. It'll buzz. Before, I, I'll finish before it buzz. Excellent. <laughs> okay. Okay. So 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 thank you, Shreya. So we'll uh, start the talk. Okay. Um, so uh, um, my uh, my uh, thank you very much for asking me to speak on Skype. This is the first Skype seminar I've ever given. Uh, I hope it goes okay. Um, the title of my talk is Chern Simon's Bose Fermi Duality in the Condensed Phase. Um, and uh, uh, the talk is based on, uh, uh, on a preprint that uh, uh, appeared last month, uh, along with these, these authors, Shantan Chaudhary, um, uh, Anshuman De, uh, Indrani, uh, Indrani Aldar, Sachin Jain, Lavneet Janagal, Myself and uh, Naveen Prabhakar, and I will also make comments during the talk that is uh, that um, are based on work in progress with uh, with uh, a subset of the above authors together with uh, George Redisovich and uh, Tarun Sharma. Okay, so let's start. Um, my talk is about uh, uh, my talk is about uh, one a particular class of quantum field theories in three in three dimensions, two plus one dimensions. Um, the theories that we will study in this talk are gauge theories. And the gauge theories with the gauge field interacting with matter. Um, the thing that is unusual about the, the, the gauge sector of this theory, um, for people who have not followed uh, this or similar developments, uh, is that the gauge theory that we will study, the, the, the gauge fields that we will study in this talk, uh, involve a self-coupling of the gauge fields through uh, a gauge field action that is this Chern Simons action that's written up here uh, rather than the more familiar Yang's action. Okay, so uh, uh, to start the talk, let's uh, most uh, almost everything about this talk is going to be about uh, these, this Chern Simons action here coupled to matter fields. Um, but to start the talk um, um, as a little warm up and an introduction to the talk, Let's first consider the Chern uh, the um, gauge field gauge theory here, uh, the pure gauge theory, gauge let's say S U N Yang uh, S U N uh, gauge theory, uh, self coupled uh, via this Chern Simons action here. There are many things about this action action and its solution that are interesting. I'm going to mention just two or three things that are going to be relevant uh, for for me. Um, one thing that strikes you when you look at this action is that uh, the action does not have a, the metric in it. You know, it's not just for brevity that there's no square root G factor here. Uh, the action literally is independent of the metric on the space in which it, uh, uh, on the space in which it's propagating. Um, this tells you or is connected to the fact that this the, the, this action here um, defines a topological field theory. So that's the first thing. The pure chance I'm saying is topological. Uh, and so already you see that it that if it makes sense at all, it's going to be pretty much simpler than, not, than, than a genuine quantum field theory. The next thing you see about this theory is that um, well, there are many things you can see about this theory, but the, but, but the thing I want you to see about this theory is that uh, it's an interacting quantum field theory. Okay, we've got a quadratic term here, ABA, which gives the property of test, but we've got a cubic term, AQ, which, um, which gives interaction matrices. Despite the fact that it's an interacting quantum field theory, uh, related to the fact that it's a topological theory, it's an exactly solvable theory, and has been exactly solved. It was exactly solved by Witten and friends about 30 years ago. Maybe, yeah, something like 30 years ago. Now, um, 
something that came out of the exact solution of this theory um, was, a, was a, uh, and it took a little time for it to be realized, but was the understanding that this, this theory here, despite being you know, near to being trivial, this, despite being a topological field theory rather than a genuine quantum field theory, um, oh, has uh, enjoys invariance under a strongly coupling duality of the sort that um, that we now are very familiar with for genuine quantum field theories. Okay, so I'm going to spend a minute or two to describe this 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 uh, strongly coupling duality. Um, the duality in question is called level rank duality, and uh, roughly speaking, is the statement that if you take the chern simons theory based on gauge group SUN and level K. That is the same as the chern simons theory based on gauge group K, a UK, and level A. I say roughly speaking because I have not kept uh, the statements are almost completely precisely correct, um, except for a couple of subtleties, one of which is that I have not kept track, track of the signs of the levels. So. Uh, um, it doesn't matter unless you have a question. Uh, what I've said is right up to science. And there's a, an additional subtlety about the level of the SUN, when, when you've got a UN theory, you've got the level of the SUN part of it and the UN part of it. Uh, unless there are questions, I won't, won't get it. Okay, so uh, just to summarize again, we've got the pure John Simons theory, which from its exact solution has been discovered to have a, or to enjoy invariance under strong weak coupling kind of duality. And the duality precisely tells you that two theories with level and rank interchange, roughly speaking, some details, one is SU, one is U and so on, but roughly two theories with level and rank interchange are actually the same theories. Now, you might wonder what, you know, how, how could you test such a duality? What, what, what computations on one side of the, uh, using, using the first theory would agree with the computations on, using the, uh, on the other side using the other theory? Well, the simplest quantities that I, that I join various under this uh, um, under this map are uh, partition functions. Now, in an ordinary quantum field theory, in addition to partition functions, you would uh, you would have correlation functions of local operators that also enjoy, enjoy invariance under duality if it's a genuine duality of the theory. In this theory, because it's to, uh, because it's topological, there are no local operators, and correlation functions of local operators are not good observables. But there are interesting observables. All of you know about these. These are Wilson lines. Um, these are Wilson lines, and uh, uh, there's an interesting map between the Wilson lines and the two sides of the duality. And the map goes this way. Uh, if I've got a Wilson line or a bunch of Wilson lines on one side on a certain manifold, that maps to a, the same bunch of Wilson lines, geometrically same bunch of Wilson lines on the same manifold on the other side. However, with an interesting catch. You see, Wilson lines are labeled not just by their shape, not just by the shape that they make in, in um, geometrical space, but also by the representation in the Wilson uh, in which the Wilson line appears. And uh, while there's nothing non-trivial in the map of shapes, a particular loop on one side maps to the same loop, same geometrical loop on the other side, and the level rank duality, even a Wilson line in a particular representation R on the first side, and the level rank duality maps to a Wilson line in another representation R, let's say R prime, uh, on the second side. And the precise rule relating R to R prime is in general complicated. But it simplifies greatly in the limit when N that we will be interested in. The limit in which N and K are both taken to be large, and the representation held fixed uh, when N and K are both taken to be large. In this limit, um, a representation can be uh, labeled by Young tableau, and uh, uh, the rule is that what you have to do to get the uh, the representation of the dual Wilson line is to transpose the Young tableau, roughly interchange. I mean, in other words, to interchange rows and columns. So, as an example, suppose you had a representation with k boxes in in the first row, that would turn into a representation uh, with k boxes in the first column. Now, k boxes in the first row is a completely symmetric product of k fundamentals. k boxes in the first column, uh, sorry, k is bad choice, q, some, some any number. Okay, q boxes in the first row and q boxes in the first column. So, um, uh, so q boxes in the first row is a completely symmetric product of q fundamentals, q boxes in the first column is a completely anti-symmetric product of q fundamentals. And uh, 
So there's an interesting map between things that are in symmetric, in the symmetric representations on one side and anti-symmetric representations on the other side. This uh, actually um, turns out to be a hint that this level rank duality of pure John Simon's theory, which has been known for 30 years and has you know, stayed a, a duality of between topological field theories, is actually a, a remnant of a more interesting uh, physical duality between physical quantum field theories. And the fact that you interchange symmetric and anti-symmetric representations is actually a hint that this is a very interesting kind of duality. It's a duality interchanging bosons and fermions. Okay. Um, more precisely, uh, the following um, uh, the following duality is believed to be true. Consider fermions in the fundamental representation coupled to S U N John Simon's theory at level k minus half. Okay. The fermions are just minimally coupled fermions, and then the S uh, then the John Simon's gauge gauge uh, gauge field self coupled to the John Simon's action in the previous transparency. This is the first part, the first side of the duality. The second side of the duality is critical. That's Wilson Fisher coupled UN, uh, sorry, UK, U mod K scalars. Okay, so this is Wilson, these are the scalars here. And the sigma phi, phi bar phi tells you that they're Wilson Fisher coupled scalars. Okay, um, okay, I'll just go on and answer the questions. Okay, so consider Wilson Fisher coupled scalars, uh, Wilson Fisher scalars minimally coupled to a, another John Simon's theory that is more or less the level rank dual of the first step. It is the level rank dual apart from the shift by half, which I'll explain to you in, in a moment. Okay, now there are many theory, uh, claims about these theories. The first claim is that, for instance, in the dimensional regularization scheme, the the the, Lagrange, the the action the path integral defined by these actions and in the dimensional re regularization scheme defines conformal field theories uh, for all integer values of n and k. This is already sort of interesting if you've not thought of thought, thought about this before, because it gives you a very large set of conformal field theories involving gauge fields um, in three dimensions. Something that that we know is very hard to do in four dimensions because the Yangman's coupling runs. Uh, the, main, the, the, the reason that this that it's easy to make conformal field theory in three dimensions in modern the Chan Simon's term is that the effect one or the effective value of g squared angles, the analog of g squared angles for this theory is one over k. And although I didn't mention it to you, uh, in order for this action to uh, define gauge invariant physics, k needs to be an integer. So the inverse coupling constant is the inverse of an integer, and therefore or cannot continuously run. Get around. This is a slick argument, it can be made more sophisticated in various ways. But this, this tells you that the thing that makes it hard to make conformal field theories in four dimensions, namely the beta function for g squared angles, is not an issue. Okay, so now the only relevant or, or marginal operator in both of these theories, at least at large n and k, uh, is a mass deformation. And uh, that can be a uh, fine tuned away to zero. A uh, convenient way to do that within uh, perturbation theory is to use a dimensional regularization scheme that automatically does, the, does this fine tuning. Now the conjecture is that these two conform these two classes of conformal field theories, these on both sides we have a two integer worth set of conformal field theories. The conjecture is that these two classes of conformal field theories are actually due to each other. They are actually the same. Okay? So this is the generalization of level rank duality, the topological duality between level uh, between uh, between pure John Simon's theories, uh, that this is one 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 generalization of level rank duality that I claim is a true generalization. Okay, that uh, uh, it, it it upgrades itself to a duality between conformal field theories, which uh, at least to my mind is more interesting than the duality between topological. Okay, uh, very quickly before we go on to say a little. More, I mean, uh, uh, we're going to quickly review the notation that we're going to use. Okay, so um, what what we're going to do is to define this Toft coupling lambda. The Toft coupling lambda for Yangman's theory is defined by n times g squared angles. Now we've already talked about how g squared angle, the role of g squared angles in these theories, played by the level, is played by one over the level. So we want to define the Toft coupling to be n by k. But instead, we're going to do something a little more 
in mm. more sophisticated began to define them to be n by kappa. Where kappa is the shifted value of k. Yeah, the shifted value is mod k plus n up to a sign. Okay. Um, there's a sense in which k gets corrected at one loop uh, to k plus n. Uh, anyone who um, who's familiar with Wessomino Witten theory knows that many physical quantities appear not with the quantity k but k plus n. Okay, so it's the same same reason that we're using this one, this 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 object here for for long, uh, for defining upper cup. Anyway, it's just a damage. Okay, so in more in this talk we're going to work at the limit n goes to infinity, k goes to infinity, and therefore kappa goes to infinity with n divided by k or equivalently n divided by kappa held fixed on the bosonic side. N boson divided by kappa boson is going to be called lambda b. That's a bosonic Toft coupling. On the fermionic side, N fermion divided by kappa fermion is going to be called lambda f. That's a fermionic Toft coupling. And uh, just by following through the uh, the duality map that is given here, uh, it's easy to convince yourself that lambda b minus lambda f is equal to an object that ha that is modulus one. In fact, it's the sine of lambda b. And if you um, don't want to keep track of signs. This uh, unpackaging this in terms of moduluses says that modulus of lambda b um, plus modulus of lambda f is equal to one. Okay, so up to signs lambda b plus lambda f is equal to one. Okay, uh, note that la the la largest allowed value of mod lambda is one, as is obvious from the definition of lambda, both for lambda b and lambda f. So given that mod lambda f plus lambda b mod lambda b is one. We conclude that um, um, duality relates the smallest possible value of mod lambda, namely zero, to the largest possible value of la mod lambda, namely one. So this is strongly coupling duality as as clear. Okay, now I'm going to give you like maybe a three-minute introduction um, into how this duality was arrived, how this duality conjecture was arrived at historically. Um, uh, okay. So the duality as presented here was first presented in a precise way by Aharoni in this paper here, um, in which he got you know, all the details right. Um, now, where did this come from? Where, 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 where was the duality? What was the origin of the duality? It's sort of a, an interesting story and maybe worth spending three or four minutes on. Um, it's a story that, to my mind, you know, is another illustration of the unity of physics. You know, the story, at least, about the duality, how the duality conjecture was arrived at. Uh, has its roots in a completely different subject. It's in the subject of the study of uh, higher spin symmetries, or, 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 or the propagation of, of hi higher than spin two particles in space time. Um, the question that Vasiliev and collaborators addressed many many years ago was a question of: Could you? Was the following question: Could you construct a classically consistent uh, theory of Propagating higher spin fields, and uh, um, the answer that Vasilyev and collaborators arrived at uh, was that um, uh, such equations are consistent in ADS space. Okay, they discovered, in fact, um, a one-parameter set of, of consistent propagating equations describing describing the interactions of of uh, higher spin fields in ADS space. Um, and the, one, the, 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 the equations that they discovered were labeled, had one parameter labeling them. Uh, let's, uh, I'm not sure about the notation used by Vasilya, but I'm, I'm going to call this parameter theta. Theta in these equations ranges from 0 to pi by 2. Um, theta above pi by 2 is related by parity flip to theta below pi, pi by 2. So it's, you know, it should be thought of as like a periodic variable with the two two extreme ends of modulo periodicity as being 0 and pi by 2. And Vasiliev's equations uh, at the extreme ends were parity invariant. Okay, and everywhere in the middle broke parity. Now, Klebanov and Polyakov in 2002 um, sort of incorporated Vasiliev's accomplishment into the ga gamut of ADS CFT. Um, in particular, they proposed that Vasiliev's equations at theta equals zero and with particular boundary conditions for scalars are dual to the singlet sector of vector like UN Wilson of the vector like UN Wilson Fisher. Uh, very soon after that, Seskin and Sundel 
uh, propose something similar for Fermi. They propose that uh, if you take UN free Fermi, you, the, UN, the UN single sector free Fermi, then the effective large and dual description of, these theory, of this theory is given by Vasiliev's equations, not at theta equals zero as before, but at theta equals pi by two. And then there were, there were, there were, there were, there were further developments, but uh, uh, relatively speaking, the, the area went quiet, uh, went quiet for a bit. Uh, at least to my mind, the, the study of this this particular set of ADSC dualities was revived by Gyeongbi and Yin in 2009, uh, when Gyeongbi and Yin um, provided impressive and very explicit calculational evidence for these these the dualities that were previously proposed. The the, the evidence was so striking and so um, direct and uh, that it forced many people to sit up and take attention, pay attention to these proposed dualities. Among the people who paid attention to these dualities was our group at um, at the IFR, along with uh, Gyeongbi and Yin, um, and also our, our Haroni, our Haroni's group and, and Wiseman. Um, and both our groups had the following idea. The idea was that um, uh, the restriction to singlets um, in, uh, um, in the two dualities proposed was most naturally achieved out of the theories of gauge. However, gauging should introduce new physics. Um, so one way of understanding what that theory, you know, how to restrict the singlets would be to couple the theory to Chernsheim and gauge fields, which have no dynamics of their own, and take k to infinity. And uh, once you have that idea, it's a natural to ask the question: what, what then is the limit? What are then is the dual of these theories coupled to Chernsheim's gauge fields, not at k equals infinity, but but at non-zero value, non-infinite values of k, and finite values of lambda. Okay, uh, both. Uh, both our group and Aharoni and collaborators group, uh, we studied the fermions, Aharoni and collaborators studied the bosons. Both of us independently argued that in our theories, uh, if you moved, if you if you worked at finite lambda rather than lambda equals zero, um, that had no effect on the scaling dimensions of single trace operators. However, three point functions of these operators were non trivial functions of lambda. Again, uh, Okay, now um, the our group had an explanation of this fact. Okay, well, 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 what what we proposed was that um, when, once you turn lambda to something non-zero, well, the dual description of this theory now, uh, continues to be given by Vasiliev's equations, but by Vasiliev's equations uh, with the theta parameter shifted away from zero in the case of bosons, or shifted away from pi by two in the case of fermions. Uh, we also did a calculation to show that the shift was proportional to lambda with a particular constant to first order in lambda. Now, you know, there's an interesting immediate consequence of this fact. You see, if um, if you've got Vasiliev, these equations at some given value of theta, you can arise at that value of theta by deforming the fermions, and you can also arrive at that value of theta by deforming the, the bosons, then it must mean that the bosonic and the fermionic theory uh, are yeah, under some duality map, the same. So uh, it, our, our observation implied, and we, we proposed that, uh, but weakly, without without knowing exactly what the duality map would be, um, that there must be some sort of duality between the bosons and the Fermi. Okay, the story continued with Maldasena and Zhubadev, um, who then showed that the highest spin symmetry of these theories was strong enough to almost completely determine the three-point functions of all single trace operators up to two parameters. And then uh, Aharoni, Gurari, and Jacobi combined our large end Schunger Dyson. Oh, by the way, we also showed that our theories were uh, solvable at large end uh, using Schwinger Dyson methods. Aharoni, Gurari, and Jacobi combined our large end Schwinger Dyson solutions with the results of Malzen and Jibane to determine the actual values of the actual duality map. And they found that the duality map up to, you know, shifts of order one in the large end limit turned out to be a level rank duality map. This made it very concrete, made, made it very, seem very, very likely that this duality was indeed correct. And then there was a lot of evidence for this duality, using basically large end solutions of this theory. The thermal partition function of the bosons and fermions were computed on both sides and shown to agree. S matrices were computed on both sides and shown to agree. And there was an analysis of how flows from supersymmetric dualities to these du to duality to, to to this basic duality um, and a careful analysis of these flows gave an argument that these 
these uh, dualities would continue to work at large enough but finite NNK. This is the first concrete evidence that the, the duality was not some large N artifact. There was additional evidence for the uh, for large N, uh, the large uh, for the finite N nature of the duality by Radisovich matching baryonic and monopoles, the spectrum of monopole and baryonic operators. And so by the time in 2015 when, uh, when you know, the duality was summarized and made completely precise by Aroni, the evidence for it was completely overwhelming, you know, maybe many tens of papers with detailed calculational evidence, at least in the large end limit. Okay. Since then, um, there's been a con connection made between these dualities and uh, things that condensed nano people independently expected to be true. And uh, this was about two and a half or three years ago. And once that happened, the field sort of took off and has moved very rapidly in many directions. I'm not going to try to summarize that. Okay. So that's it for the background, what, what, what the duality is and what, what uh, uh, the history of how it was arrived at. Okay. In the uh, uh, next um, four or five minutes, I'm going to uh, describe a particular aspect of this duality that has in some sense been clear since for five, five years, but I'm going to uh, emphasize various aspects of it uh, uh, strongly and that will lead up to the calculation I present. So as I've explained to you that the, the basic duality here is a duality between two conformal field theories. Now, if two conformal field theories are dual, then any relevant deformation that you add, well, firstly, the relevant deformations of the two sides must be in one-to-one -one correspondence. And if you take the conformal field theory and deform it by a relevant deformation, then it must be, give you the same theory as the dual theory deformed by the dual relevant deformations. Okay? So the duality between the two conformal field theories if it's correct, it implies a duality between RD flows uh, induced by relevant deformations on both sides. Now you can ask, so in, in the particular case that I've explained, to, I've described to you, what are the relevant deformations of the theories? Well, the relevant deformations of the theories are very simple. The only relevant operators, is something we had occasion to mention before, the only relevant operators on both sides are mass operators for the theories. Now, you see, the mass is a real mass. So, um, any positive value of the mass and any is same as every other positive value of the mass by scale invariance. Okay? Similarly, any negative value of the mass is same as any other negative value of the mass by scale invariance. So really, um, there are two different inequivalent mass deform theories. The def deformed conformity theories. Conformity theories deformed by positive mass, conformity theories deformed by negative mass. Okay. Now, now, you could look at conformity theories defined by, defined by positive mass and go to very low energies and ask uh, what, what you get. Okay, um, so, so, so let's study this question for a minute. Let's first start with the fermions. Suppose I take the fermions and deform the theory by positive mass. Now, it's a well-known fact that if you take a positive mass fermionic field in the fundamental representation and integrate it out, you change the level of the of the uh, of the fermionic theory. Uh, the effective IR level obtained after integrating on the mass is the UV level plus the sine of m divided by two. So now there are two distinct cases. In the first case, the sine of the mass is the same as the sine of the UV level. In the second case, the sine of the mass is opposite to the sine of the UV. Clearly, uh, the in the first case. Integrating out the mass increases the modulus of, of, the, uh, of the level by, one, by half. Whereas in the second case, integrating out the mass uh, decreases the modulus of the, uh, 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 of the level by one. And so the two effective moduli, the moduli of the two diff effective I, uh, the, effect, the two effective IR moduli differ by a factor of one. The first case has larger modulus, the second case has a smaller modulus, and the difference is one. K A minus K B is one when both equations, both things are true in modulus. Okay. So what we concluded in each, what, what we concluded to start with is that the positive mass deformation and the negative mass deformation give you inequivalent results, even in the deep IR. Because we get uh, the deep IR is governed by two different topological field theories. Both are chern simons theories, both of the same rank, but with slightly different levels, levels that differ by one. Okay? 
So on the fermions, we form a, um, a mental picture of the phase diagram. As you vary the mass, uh, you, you have a phase transition between two different low energy phases. The order parameter for the low energy phases are the topological field theories that describe low energy physics. And in between these two different uh, topological, uh, two different phases lies a conformal field theory, the parent conformal field theory we've been studying. That sounds interesting. Okay, now let's see how the same thing works with the bosons. Okay, now it's a fact that when you integrate out massive bosons, the level of the bosons just don't change. However, when, when you integrate out the, when, the bosons, at positive mass and negative mass behave differently in a more elementary way. Bosons at positive mass, you integrate out the bosons, you just get SUN level K churn Simon's theory. SUNB level KB churn Simon's theory. On the other hand, if you turn on a negative bosonic mass, and I'll show you the Lagrangian for this in a minute. If you turn on a negative bosonic mass, it forces the bosons to condense. Condensation of a fundamental field breaks SUN to SUN minus one. And so, uh, turning on a negative bosonic mass shifts the rank of the bosonic theory by one, reduces the rank, causes the rank of the bosonic, of the effective topological churn Simon's theory that you get in the IR by one, leaving the level the same on both sides. But, you know, so we've got two different phases, one labeled by SUN level K and the other labeled by SUN minus one level K. But these these two different topological field theories are precisely level rank dual to the two different topological field theories we got on the fermion side. Because remember, level rank duality basically interchanges level and rank. So the fermion, the two levels differed by one, the, the boson case, the two ranks differed by one. Okay, so that's a picture of the, the phases of both theories and how at least at extremely low energies, um, uh, you have the same order parameter distinguished equivalent order parameters distinguishing the two phases. So this can be thought of as a consistency check of the picture. Now I want to give you a more detailed consistency check. And the more detailed consistency check goes as follows. Look, suppose what you're doing is to study the physics around one of these two phases, these two massive phases. What you can do is to study the effect of prop the propagation of a few excitations around this, this, this the, the, around the, vac the vacuum phase. And uh, a particularly interesting limit to study is a limit in which the energy, you've got NX, let's say, Q excitations, and the energy is uh, is not too much larger than Q times the mass of each excitation. In this limit, the effective excitations behave, rel uh, behave relativistic, no, sorry, non-relativistic, and are governed by, a, uh, by an effective Schrodinger. Okay, so now you could ask, well, uh, now something might puzzle you. You see, you've got an effective Schrodinger equation describing some effective excitations moving around. But these effective excitations, the Schrodinger equations for these excitations depends on their spin. Because the, the kinetic term couples to the spin connection of the manifold in which you're moving. Okay? And you can ask, how can it be that bosons are the same as fermions? Because bosons have spin zero and fermions have spin half, so it's just not possible for the two Schrodinger equations to be the same. However, you know, this conclusion that bosons and fermions both have spin uh, are different spins actually, turns out to be actually too fast. Um, in matter and Simon's theories, it's possible to show using um, using a calculation that's similar to the Saha calculation, you know, the calculation that um, the elementary calculation that shows you that there's an E cross B angular momentum in uh, uh, in fields in four dimensions. Uh, you can actually show that there is a version of this E cross B kind of angular momentum in um, um, John Simon's fields sourced by a charged excitation. And this, uh, this version of the <coughs> E cross B angular momentum uh, gives you a contribution to the angular momentum of the excitation, which turns out to be C2R divided by 2 kappa, where C2R <coughs> is the quadratic, R is the representation in which the particle is sitting, C2R is the quadratic Casimir of that representation, and kappa we've encountered before. It's the shifted level, k, k plus n. Okay, classically the, you get C2R divided by 2k, and a one loop effect changes that to C2R divided by 2 kappa. Okay, so, you know, um, these John Simon's matter theories are subtle. Spins of excitations are not what they naively appear to be. 
there's in addition to an intrinsic spin, there's what we call the statistical contribution to the spin. And for the two Schrodinger equations to be the same, for physics to be the same on the two sides, what we require is not that the intrinsic spins match, but that the total spin matches. Okay. Now, part of the total spin just comes from the C2R. Right? So, um, C2R is just a group theory quantity. And it's easy to check that I, I told you how, the, how representations map under level rank duality, at least the small representations of interest to us. And using the rule for that and doing some group theory, it's easy to check that the difference between the statistical spins on the fermion side and the statistical spin on the bosonic side is a simple group theory calculation to check that you get n by 2 in modulus and a sign, sign of kf. Where n is the number of boxes in the young tableau of the representation in which the fermions or the bosons appear. Now, if the total spin is going to be the same on both sides, it has to be that the in intrinsic bosonic spin is given then by the intrinsic fermionic spin, but that an intrinsic fermionic, the intrinsic fermionic spin of a Dirac particle of mass m turns out to be the sine of m divided by 2. So that's this, minus this difference. That's minus half n SGM kf. So duality can only work if this equation, the equation that right at the bottom of this transparency is correct. Now, I re re reproduce this equation at the top of this transparency, so duality requires that this be correct. Now, this, this equation is an interesting equation, and has, there are several uh, conclusions. Firstly, if n is large enough, let's say n was 20, we would find a very large intrinsic spin for the boson. Okay, no matter what the details where you get a spin, you know, 9 or larger, something like that. Now, if you want this to be the spin of an elementary excitation that goes into constructing your quantum field theory, you're probably out of luck. You know, we, we don't know how to make quantum field theories of elementary massless particles with arbitrarily high spin. So already this equation suggests that these kind of matter chun Simons dualities probably work best with representations that are small, where n is small. Okay. This is an interesting qualitative conclusion that agrees with every example of proposed dualities of this sort, um, even over the last two or three years where proposals of this sort have exploded. However, now our, our talk is about the simplest case, n is equal to 1, so let's stick to that. This makes a prediction. It makes a prediction that, you see, if n is 1, then in the case that the mass of the fermion is the same, has the same sign as the mass of Kf, these two things cancel each other, so the intrinsic bosonic spin should be 0. And that sounds very good, because the intrinsic spin of bosons is zero. However, there's something that at first sight that looks a little puzzling. The thing is that when the mass of the fermion is opposite in sign from the mass of Kf, then the intrinsic bosonic spin looks like it should have modulus 1. Okay? And that might at first sight seem puzzling, because our theory involved just spin zero bosons, which didn't, didn't seem to allow them to have Modulus 1. How can this be? Now, this actually connects with something we've already talked about. Remember, on the bosonic side, one of the two phases was a phase in which the bosons have condensed. Okay? And when the bosons have condensed, um, the bosons are charged particles in some representation of the gauge group, and when they've condensed, they trigger the Higgs mechanism. Once the Higgs mechanism is triggered, the true excitations of the theory are W bosons. W bosons have spin up to some in modulus that spin of or of what uh, spin spin one. So this could also work out right if some signs work out right, and I'm going to assure you that the, the signs do work out right. It could also work out right, provided uh, uh, in the condensed phase, the excite spin spins of excitations will turn out to be one. This will be the W bosons in non-condensed phase. The excitations of scalar particles. These these are the ordinary bosons. Yeah. So this is the idea of how, how this duality of between conformal field theories works in the two phases. In the rest of this talk, what I'm going to do is to give you detailed calculational evidence in the large end limit that this, this picture is correct. Okay, so now we're going to have to go a little fast. Uh, so let's do it. Um, see, first let me say, let me be very clear. The theory, the two theories I'm studying are the mass deformed fermionic theory. So I already wrote down the conformal field theory for you, but then I study it definitely formed by mass. The second side of the, the uh, duality that I uh, work out is uh, the mass deformed bosonic theory. Got it in uh, the conformal field theory for you, but I deformed that with the mass. 
Okay. Now, in earlier work, um, the thermal partition function for the fermionic theory for all ranges of parameters, so positive mass, negative mass, everything, has been computed. And the thermal partition function of the bosonic theory in the uncondensed phase has been computed. And the two results, the two thermal partition functions have been found to match under duality. The thermal partition of the fermion theory was computed by integrating out the spin half fermionic excitations. Uh, the thermal partition function of the bosons was computed by integrating out the spin zero um, bosonic excitations. However, it's, they, although we know the result from the fermion side, the answer for the thermal partition function on the, in the condensed phase, in the phase where the bosons have condensed and we just argued the effective excitations must be spin one excitations, has never previously been computed so that we never had quantitative verification of the picture that I just sketched. Okay? I'm now going to give you that verification. But in order to do that, I have to recall one very, one uh, element, one, one property of these computations of partition functions, um, which I will do without, without giving in a detailed um, explanations. It turns out that if you want to compute the partition function of these theories on S2 times S1 uh, at large enough temperatures, uh, you're supposed, to, you're instructed to follow the following procedure. The first thing you're supposed to do is to compute the partition function of the theory on R2 times S1 at fixed values of the holonomy of the gauge field around the thermal circle. The second thing you're supposed to do is then to compute, um, to take the results from the first calculation and do a, a matrix integral over this holonomy um, with the action being given by the result of the first part of the, part of the theory, uh, of the calculation. Now, the second part is very interesting and involves many interesting phase transitions and so on, but that will not be in the subject of my talk. All I'm going to be talking about is equation three. Okay, the analog of equation three, doing the, the computation on R2 times S1 as fixed values of velocity. And I'm doing this because it turns out that uh, duality works already at the level of this integral, integral if you know how to process it. Okay, see, so you don't have to worry about how to do this calculation. Uh, you just have to know how to calculate this effective little view. Okay. So in this talk, what I'm going to be doing is to do, do the following. I'm going to be doing the path integral of our theory at some fixed value of, at a fixed uh, value of the holonomy uh, in, inside this integral. Okay. So um, this is the, okay, let's get this right. Okay, great. So now I'm going to set up the, uh, set up the computation. So I'm interested in the bosonic theory in the one place where this calculation has never been done before, namely in the condensed phase. So I'm interested in the bosonic theory, uh, which the Rattin is given here. This is the Chern Simons action. I've used X for Chern Simons field because very soon I'm going to I'm going to reserve the symbol A for a slightly different Chern Simons field. And uh, uh, this is the Chern Simons action, and uh, this is the bosonic uh, 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 the the matter part of the action. So there's the scalar fields, there's the interact the, the thing that makes it critical. And uh, then there's the sigma mb cree term that makes it massive. Now mb cree is negative. That's the situation in which uh, we're in the condensed phase. Okay. So let's look at the sigma equation of motion when mb cree is negative. The sigma equation of motion tells us that phi bar phi is equal to minus nb by 4 pi mb cree. Now this equation has no real solution if mb cree is positive, but when mb cree is negative, it does. And in fact, this the the fact that this equation has to be obeyed, forces us to set um, phi bar phi, which, uh, which I call v squared here, oh, no, which I call mod kappa b times v squared, um, uh, to be equal to nb by 4 pi times nb cream. In mod, uh, yeah, oh, just, you can take modulus on both sides if the minus confuses. Okay, so that tells you that the scalar must condense because phi bar phi has an expectation value. Now, now the scalar condenses, it has a particular, a particular frozen expectation value that follows from the sigma equation of motion. Okay, now it has this particular frozen expectation value and uh, its orientation in group scale, space can be completely fixed if we work in unitary gauge. So we choose to work in unitary gauge in which we orient this phi in group space to be completely in the nb direction and to be completely real. So phi by choice of gauge is pushed into the nb direction and made to be completely real. And then by the sigma equation of motion, that completely real value is fixed. So phi is now completely frozen with our choice of gauge. There's no path integral over phi left anymore. 
The remaining path integral in our theory is over the gauge field. But now the gauge fields um, can, you know, are bro bro break up into inequivalent sectors. Because our choice of gauge and, and the expectation value for phi, the dynamical expectation value for phi, breaks uh, the SUN gauge symmetry to SUN minus 1. So our gauge fields include an SUN minus 1 gauge boson. That, that's present. That's the thing we call A mu here. Uh, wherever it is. Yeah, A mu here. That's the SUN minus 1 gauge boson. But it also includes these W bosons, these, these things that were in the A and B direction. The things that are lie in the you know, top column or top row, the nbth column or nbth row of the matrix, and that transform in the fundamental of SUN minus 1. And finally, there's the NBNP component of the gauge field, which we call the Z boson. Okay, so we've got a W boson, which is fundamental of SUN minus 1, a Z boson, and the SUN minus 1 gauge field. And in our particular choice of gauge, you can rewrite the, uh, uh, the action of our theory um, in terms of the SUN minus 1 gauge fields, the W boson, the Z, and the Z boson. Okay, so we do that. Now, something that I uh, that that is interesting to do, but I'll brush over because I'm running out of time, is uh, uh, to take the equations of motion and linearize them here. Uh, so to find the linearized equations of motion for W and Z. Um, you find uh, that these equations of motion tell you that W and Z are both massive fields, and you find that the mass of the Z boson is twice the mass of the W boson. We'll come back to that in a bit. Uh, and you also find that the spins of the W and Z bosons are determined and turn out to be not just mag magnitude one, but with signs that agree with what was needed <coughs> in the earlier part of matching spins under duality. Okay, I won't go. I'll quickly skip over. Okay, so now we've got this Lagrangian and uh, um, we want to do some physics. So what I want to do is to compute this thermal partition function. So the first thing we do is to set the gauge A minus is equal to zero in the remaining SUN minus one direction. That eliminates the A cube term here because this has an A wedge, A wedge, A, and any one component of A being zero sets the whole thing to zero. So now, once we've done that, the theory is quadratic in A and also quadratic in Z. So we can just simply integrate out both A and Z from the, uh, from the action. And when you do that, you get an effective action just for the remaining field, namely W, which is not quadratic. There's a quadratic part and then there's a quadratic part. And the quadratic part, which came from an exchange of uh, um, exchange of either exchanges involving either the integrated out A or the Z, is some horribly non-local stuff that I've written in detail here, but we don't have the time to look at it in much detail. Okay. So the first step is to integrate out the gauge field, integrate out also the Z boson. And you've got some very non-local effective, a very non-local but very explicit effective action for the W's. <laughs> now the next step is to do a trick. And the trick is to rewrite the action in terms of signals. So what we do is to introduce one is equal to an integral over a delta function, where that integral is over a bilocal variable alpha mu nu. Where alpha mu nu is w bar mu w nu of at x and y or in Fourier space at q and p, the two momenta uh, dual uh, for, for, for the gauge boson. Now, it's important that this alpha mu nu has no gauge indices. The gauge indices are contracted between w bar and w, w even though position indices are wherever you want. And then once we, got, we insert this delta function into the path integral and then exponentiate the delta function. So there's a Lagrange multiplier field, a sigma mu nu, that exponentiates the delta function. Okay, so we've got two new sets of, of horrible looking bilocal Lagrange multiplier fields. The, good, the only good thing about these Lagrange multiplier fields is that they SUN signals. Now, the point of introducing this Lagrange alpha Lagrange multiplier field is that the quartic interaction in W can be rewritten as a bilinear interaction in alphas because alpha was W bar W. Okay, so uh, you you do that. You rewrite the action in term uh, in an, in a term uh, with a term that is purely quadratic in Ws. This quadratic piece here has the bare kinetic term as well as a sigma W W, w bar W term, and then the inter the horrible interaction piece has gone totally into the alpha sector. Okay, 
So the action is now quadratic in W, so you can integrate out the Ws, and you get an effective action, which is NB times the log of this Q matrix here, the effective quadratic part of the, uh, the action for the Ws. Okay. And you also have this V of alpha, which is just unaffected. It's what we had before, but with W bar W replaced by alpha. So schematically, this is the full final action. Now, the interesting thing about this action is that it's got a factor of NB outside it overall. Because it's got a factor of NB outside it overall, and because the remaining fields in the path integral have no gauge indices, all are singlets, we can now compute the path integral over sigma and alpha just by extremizing this effective action with respect to sigma and alpha. Okay? So the extremization gives us some saddle point equations. Okay, now there are many things that I, many symmetries that we use and so on that I don't have. Okay, uh, let me quickly say this. The, the first, the, the, <coughs> the uh, um, equation involving coming from variation of sigma is almost a triviality. It tells us that alpha is the propagator of the W fields. This is a triviality because that's what alpha was when we introduced it into the path integral. Obviously, alpha was W by W, so obviously it was the propagator. The interesting equation is that the propagator of the W fields has a self energy. And the self energy obeys an interesting self consistency equation. Self consistency equation because it involves the propagator, which itself is given in terms of sigma. Okay, so varying the action with respect to alpha and sigma gives us these two classical, uh, classical <coughs> equations. Okay, these are classical integral equations which we now have to solve. Now, uh, there are many things that we have to do, and I'm going to rush over this. Okay, symmetries allow you symmetries and one or two other things allow you to take to show that out of the six possible non-zero components of sigma only four are non-zero and moreover that these that the dependence of these components can be is determined by symmetry up to an unknown function of one variable that one variable is q bar q so remember we're working in this light cone gauge so light cone gauge is in the r2 direction q plus is like x plus i y q minus is x minus i y and W is just the modulus of the momentum in that, in those two dimensions, so the radial moment. Okay, in terms of these four unknown functions of one variable, F1, F2, F3, F4, the effective quadratic term for the W becomes this. Uh, the determinant of W becomes this, where M squared W is some horrible combination of Fs, which we'll come back to later. And uh, uh, in terms of all of this, the integral equations can be processed and rewritten in the form uh, in a form that involves just these four equations, uh, four functions of one variable, f1, f2, f3, f4. And this is what the equation, integral equations become. Okay. So what, what are these integral uh, what are these integral equations? Be? Okay, where this chi of z is some horrible thing. Okay, chi of z is this quantity here involving this quantity m of z, where m of z is this horrible object. Okay. So these equations, what's the summary? The summary at the moment looks like, uh, okay, the problem has become classical. You've got some integral equations, but the integral equations are four, about four variables, four functions in one variable. There are four coupled integral equations. The equations are highly nonlinear, high, look highly non-trivial, looks like you may want to do some approximations and numerics, but you've got no real hope of solving this problem exactly. The reason I'm giving this talk is that that expectation is not true. Um, if, if you look at these equations hard enough and you have sufficiently uh, talented collaborators like, like I did, uh, then uh, yeah, you can take these equations and actually solve them exactly. Okay, there are many bells and whistles in the solution. I will not go through it all. I'll just give you the answer. Now this guy here, I told you, was this horrible object and we'll, um, we'll take this. It's a horrible object, but it's explicit in terms of rho. Oh God, I haven't told you about rows. I'm sorry. Um, I told you that we were looking at the pro we, we were going to compute the partition function as a function of the holonomy of the of a zero around the time time server. Now, in the large end limit, the best way to parameterize this holonomy, to characterize this holonomy, is by its eigenvalue density function. So rho here is the eigenvalue density function, which could be anything. Remember, we're computing this as a function of the holonomy. See, the rule is you give me the eigenvalue density function, and I should give you the answer for the partition function. So this chi here is given by this integral over holonomies of this object. Okay, and zeta is the integral of chi with respect to its argument z, its argument w. Okay, after a lot of lot of work, after a lot of work and some 
uh, a good deal of ingenuity, turns out you can solve all these equations. Uh, turns out that the solution of these equations is given in terms of these chi, zeta, and one more, an integral of zeta, this i function here. G is a rescaled version of zeta, and i is a, an integral of g. In terms of the chi, zeta, and i, you can find, an <coughs> find completely explicit exact solutions for these uh, for these integral equations. They've been listed. Now, what a really an important property of these, these explicit solutions is that this quantity m squared here, which um, was this horrible combination of functions, on the explicit solutions turns out to be a constant. So in particular, the effective quadratic form for the w's has a very simple determinant. The determinant is just given by q squared, which is q plus q minus plus q3 squared plus constant squared. Now that's very important because you know the zeros of the determinant of an object give you the poles of its propagator, uh, of the quadratic form give you the poles of the propagator. And the fact that you get such a lovely uh, uh, determinant of Q tells you that the poles of the propagators that we compute have a Lorentz invariant form. It's quite striking and in fact quite surprising because we turn on a thermal circle, there's no particular consistency reason for this, this uh, away from the zero temperature limit, there's no reason for these propagators to be Lorentz invariant, yes, they turn out to be. Okay, and then that immediately tells Hello? you that this n squared, yeah. Uh, so that, that was just your time bell, if you uh -huh. so Yeah, I, I, I'll take maybe three, four more minutes okay. to finish. Okay, yeah. So the, um, the, the m, this m squared here, that is, has a particular physical interpretation. The interpretation of m squared is that the thermal mass of the excitation, of the excitations, of, namely the true excitation, clearing here, namely the W. Now, I told you that this set of Fs was a solution of our integral equations, but I was imprecise. This set of Fs was a solution of the integral equations where M was a constant, but not any constant. When M was a constant that obeyed a particular equation, okay, this M is the same as the CB here, I'm sorry for switching notation. M is the same as the CB, and this S here, is some function of C. Um, okay, the first thing I wanted to say about the discussion is uh, in the, in the uh, uh, thing I want to say about the first discussion slide is this. Um, that firstly, the fact that the thermal mass of the fermions and the thermal mass of the W bosons matched exactly is very clear quite calculational demonstration that these are the dual excitations. Now, um, this is great, but it sounds like there's a puzzle. The puzzle is that on the bosonic side, there's one additional excitation that seems to have no analog on the fermionic side, and that's the Z boson. The Z boson actually turned out to play no role in our calculation, but it's there. The fermions map to the W bosons, what about the Z boson? This sounds like a puzzle, but it's not a sharp puzzle. It's not a sharp puzzle because uh, there's a possible interpretation, and the interpretation is suggested by the fact that the Z boson, the classical mass of the Z boson, is actually, it turns out, as I've mentioned to you before, is twice that of the W boson. This suggests that a possible interpretation of the Z boson. It suggests that the Z boson, in, in the place where the bosonic theory is classical, the Z boson is a bound state of threshold of psi bar and psi. Now, this bound state is a threshold exactly where the bosonic theory is free, a zero couple. As you move away from the free point, there are two possibilities to this bound state. Either it'll become a genuine bound state or it'll become a uh, residence. Okay, good. Now, um, okay, so uh, the se second discussion slide. Um, something that I've not emphasized is that um, all our calculations were carried out in principle at finite values of the chemical potential. Now, both sides of the duality have a, have a global U1 charge and it's possible to turn on a chemical potential on both sides. And the agreement persists also at finite chemical potential. Now, though we formally see that the thing that the two sides are the same at finite chemical potential, there's a physical thing about this, especially if we could also do the calculation of background magnetic field, uh, magnetic field for the U1 global charge. There's something physical about this that is interesting, I think. Has already been commented on by a paper of Sohn and student, but I think it deserves more attention, and that's this. You see, at finite chemical potential, the fermions form a Fermi C. At finite um, um, chemical potential and weak coupling, the fermions form a Fermi C. Finite chemical potential and weak coupling, the bosons form a Bose condensate. 
So our either the fermionic theory or the bosonic theory is giving you the thermodynamics of something that interpolates smoothly between a Fermi C and a Bose condensate. Okay, so the Fermi it's a Fermi C that has strong coupling mocks up Bose condensate behavior, or a Bose condensate that has strong coupling mocks up Fermi C behavior. And I think I don't know exactly what the sharp question is here, but it sounds like interesting and sounds like there may be lessons that you want to investigate further. Um, I think that this this would be even more interesting if we could do the do the calculations which we've not yet done in the presence of a magnetic field uh, for the background uh, background U1 symmetry. Um, okay, finally, the third discussion slide is about some, a technicality about phase transitions at zero temperature and finite temperature. How how we expect there to be no phase transitions at at the, uh, okay. Let me just say, you see. In our theory at zero temperature, as I argued to you before, there's a phase transition. There's an order parameter, namely the topological field theory at low energies on the two sides of the uh, of the duality. And the conformal field theory is on the boundary between the two phases. A map, it's, the conformal field theory separates the two phases. When we do the calculation at finite temperature, however, it's not clear that there's any phase transition. In fact, it appears that there is no phase transition. See, there's no order parameter that distinguishes the first phase of finite temperature from the second phase of finite temperature. In particular, the order parameter of the zero temperature theory, namely the topological behavior of the theory, um, is no longer accurate because at very long distances now the theory is not a chern science theory but some two-dimensional theory because we've got the theory in R2 times S1. Okay, so there's no clear order parameter distinguishing the two theories at finite temperature and I believe uh, that our that the theory has no, no phase transition. Now we can see this in formulas in the following way. If you look at our, the zero temperature the results of all our uh, limit of all our answers, let's say the thermal, the effective mass of the uh, uh, W boson, that has a normal analyticity as it goes through the, the conformality theory. So consistent with the idea that there is a phase transition at zero temperature. On the other hand, if you work at any fixed temperature and move from one phase to the other, there's no phase transition. All, all quantities, let's say the pole mass of the free energy, are just completely analytic, at least in this large element, and I believe that's the exact same. So now, this is very interesting and very odd. It's very odd because, you see, what happened here was that while at zero temperature there's a precise phase transition, at finite temperature there's no phase transition in the answer, and yet there's a phase transition in our calculation. Because to get the answer in one part of the phase diagram, we had to do a different calculation for the answer in another part of the phase diagram. One calculation was involving integrating out zero, zero spin uh, uh, five fields. The other calculation was integrating out uh, spin one W bosons. The calculations were very different of the, in, on the two sides, and yet in the end, the final answers turned out to be analytic continuations of each other. So there is a sense a purely calculation, a calculational sense in which there is some sort of, well, almost a triality going on in the sense that there are three different calculations, all of which give the same answer. There's the calculation by integrating out the scalars, the spin zero scalars, there's the calculation by integrating out the spin one W bosons, and there's the calculation by integrating out uh, the spin half fermions after you apply the duality map. So three different, completely different calculations, all of which give you the same answer. Of course, two of these calculations are somehow on the, on the same side of the duality. And uh, the fact that you did two different, very different calculations, but not analytic continuations of the same answer, perhaps suggests that there is a better way of doing a calculation once and for all in the bosonic phase that refers neither to the spin zero excitations nor the spin one excitations, but somehow some conglomerate, I don't know what. And it would be interesting to see how that works. I've never seen anything like this before, a phase transition in the method of calculation and but analytic continuation of the answer. That's all I wanted to say about the discussion. Thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, yeah, we can hear you. So we'll try and take some questions now. Yeah. Hey. Uh, hi, Shiraz. Thanks. Uh, hi. Uh, uh, so um, uh, uh, I, I, I was wondering, in addition to these elementary excitations, uh, are there uh, vortex-like excitations in the uh, in the condensed phase, which one can try to um, uh, to map to the fermionic uh, theory some maybe uh, um, I don't know monopole operators or something I'm not very sure uh, yeah yeah it's believed that at the level let, let's just take the uh, 
Um, uh, let's first look at the uh, look at the look at look at the conformal field theory. So in the conformal field theory, you could ask, uh, apart from single elementary single trace type operators, are there more interesting operators that map between the two sides? So the, uh, in the case where the on the side where the uh, where the gauge group is SUN, there are baryon type operators. Okay, on the side where the gauge group is UN. There are no baryon type operators because you went for bits baryons, but there are monopole type operators. Okay, uh, now uh, on the side where you've got uh, uh, the, the, you see the, the baryon type operators has, have n fields in them. The monopole type operators have minimum of some k fields in them because you have to saturate a Gauss law which says k times f is equal to something. And these two map under level rank duality. So, the, so part of the map is that baryons map to monopoles. And that will continue to persist somehow along in, 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 uh, both, phase, in both phases. Now, there may be a more, more physical version of this. Give me a moment. Mm. I think you know that the, the, the vortex that you're talking about. Let's say it's a U1 vortex. Yeah. It's a vortex of the U1 part. Uh, once again, it will have to, you know it will be, obey a chern simons equation of motion. Right. So it'll be the equation of motion k times f is equal to uh, charge. Now f will be quantized with like a two pi quantization. So this will fix that this vortex will come with with k units of bound charge. To obey this equation of motion, so this will be an excitation that will be very heavy, and will be the analog of the monopole operator on that side. Uh, so this will, this would be my guess. The side which is U n would have these vortex type type excitations uh, because there's a dynamic U one, and then there will be some analog on the other side which will be the analog of the baryonic type excitations. It's interesting. I haven't thought about it very clearly. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, Shiraz. I have a question. Uh, Hi, sir. So, uh, in all these uh, uh, works in, uh, in the Chern Simons matter theory for dualities, now are there any lessons for Vasiliev theory in the dual? Because yeah. the field theory is so much under control now. Well, yeah, I, I would imagine there are several lessons. Well, um, firstly, there are many predictions. Right, all these com computations of thermal partition functions are predictions of black hole thermodynamics for Vasiliev theory. Um, so it would be great to get um, um, a, a direct Vasiliev um, verification of these predictions. Now, in Vasiliev theory, uh, I haven't followed it for the last few, last three or four years, very closely. But when I last followed it closely, um, there were proposals for black hole type solutions. But it seems very hard to compute the thermodynamics of these solutions because um, you know the Vasiliev theory does does not is most naturally formulated in terms of equations of motion, so it is not obvious how to compute an action for these solutions. Um, there were also various anyway. So I think one 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 um, clear challenge to Vasiliev theory is this: to find black hole type solutions for these theories, and in these black hole type solutions to compute the free energy. Compute the you know compute all thermodynamic quantities, and to then try uh, to see if we can find agreement with the field theory. I think that's that would that's a sharp challenge, and that would help clarify many issues in Vasiliev theory, uh, especially since we feel pretty confident we know the right answers in the field theory. Uh, that's one thing to say. Um, yeah, um, let's see. Uh, what 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 other lessons are there for Vasiliev theory? Well, another 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 kind of le lesson that. Um, was illustrated in in papers that came four or five years ago out of Stanford uh, was this that um, you know if you take John Simon's theory of S two times time, then the only uh, states of the theory that then you know by the state operator map, there's a one to one correspondence between uh, uh, states of states of the theory on S two and operators of the theory in R three and. Uh, these operators of the theory are in one to one, the single trace operators in one to one map with Vasiliev fields. These are the has been fields of, of the bulk. Um, and so that all works great. However, the Stanford people, Schenker and Shamik and various other people, 
um, emphasized that when you looked at Judd Simon's theory on other gene, other uh, genus Riemann manifolds, you know, for instance, a torus or a genus two Riemann sphere, yeah, a Riemann manifold, um, the spectrum of states of the theory included things that went beyond things you would get from the single trace set. Because there was a part of the th part of the spectrum that came just from pure John Simon's theory on uh, on these manifolds, and then pure John Simon's theory on these manifolds has n square states. This suggests that Basilian theory, uh, when formulated on sufficiently com sufficiently complicated um, uh, manifolds, manifolds with sufficiently complicated boundaries, is incomplete. It suggests that the Basilian's equations need to be supplemented with some sort of Topological, almost topological sector at the boundary, and uh, uh, presumably there's some direct logic within Vasiliev theory for this. Um, uh, this 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 phenomenon is not not dissimilar to this phenomenon of light states and Rajesh's dualities, Rajesh and Matthias's dualities. And I think it would be nice to see if one could, um, but but it's more controlled because there is a situation, namely S two times time, uh, when these light states are not there. So these 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 additional light states clearly have to do with something with the topology of the boundary, and um, it would be interesting. I think if uh, if uh, the people studying Basilia theory uh, could, could could sort of see the see where in their framework this is necessitated. Perhaps it's all related to having action for Basilia theory. Maybe an action is not possible without these extra modes on a higher dimension genus. Yeah. And then there are, well, there are various other issues. Okay, I should stop it. There are many things, you know, the, the, the getting ABGM theory, confinement, and so, uh, there are many things about Basilia theory that are very interesting, but uh, seem harder, as you say, to answer in, in the bulk than in the field. Okay, thanks. Uh, Vasilia wants to respond. Okay. Uh, uh, no, I'm not just respond. Hi, Shuras. Uh, Hi, Vasilia. A comment Hi. and the question. So uh, first, let me note that uh, there is a way to compute charges for black holes in Hirschman theory. Actually, okay. there was a paper relatively recently, like maybe one year ago, uh, where we were used some invariant functionals, which are on-shell invariant functionals, not off-shell actions, but something that substitutes that. Uh, that really was shown to reproduce properly the black hole charges, at least in the linearized approximation we were considering. So that's uh, in principle, include, yeah. Including the entropy? Yeah, I think you can compute the entropy. The point is that we were not able to do this at the full nonlinear level. So that was just a first step towards that direction. Uh, the question that I wanted to ask, I mean, uh, it's not about thermodynamics, but about this massive deformation. Would it be interesting to have an um, ADS for dual for all these yes, I, family I of models? Yes, I think it would be very interesting, and I also think we know the rules for what, what what we want. We want a solution to your equations that differs at the boundary from the solution corresponding to the ADS vacuum, in exact in a way that's governed by the rules of ADS CFT. Yeah. Because you know we know by what we know which massive op which operator is deforming the theories. Just trace phi squared, for instance, or I mean, trace psi by psi for them. It's the the, the scalar. If we want to turn on the non 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 normalizable part of your scalar. Other than that, the theory should have no difference at infinity, and then we want the solution in the uh, down here. And I think it would be very interesting. For instance, you know, yeah, it would be very interesting in many ways. Um, just a final comment, if you like. I mean that uh, normally with the, those models that are considered in the literature, they are missing a lot of uh, topological fields that actually can be included and for the computation of black hole phenomena they should be included and that actually brings a lot uh, of additional degrees of freedom maybe they play a role in non-trivial uh, geometries so that was not uh, studied so far i believe yeah I, I think that would be very interesting it would be really interesting to see that that there were, you would have to trigger some of these degrees of freedom let's say on the torus when you don't uh, when the when the boundary is t2 times r time but you don't have to trigger them and the boundary is S2 times 10. And that's what the field theory predicts. And it would be really interesting to see if that was the case. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. These, these degrees of freedom don't contribute if geometry is trivial, but they do contribute if it is non-trivial. So that's why maybe they were missed actually in the previous analysis. Okay, thank okay. you. Yeah, that would be very interesting. So I, I think we, we should close the session because we had, we had 11 o'clock. So 
Uh, so uh, th thank you very much, uh, Shiraz, uh, for for this uh, nice talk. Uh, we'll close. Okay. Okay. Uh, so thank you. Uh, so we'll we'll break now for coffee, and we'll be back at uh, eleven thirty.